Thursdays, stream on Hulu. I understand Americans are anxious, and they're anxious for good reason. Today, the President of the United States addressed the price pain Americans are coping with as inflation balloons to a new 40-year high, sending stocks tumbling. Between the hike at the pump and the higher cost of nearly everything you buy, we're seeing the worst price spike in generations. What the Treasury Secretary has to say about a potential recession. I couldn't believe my eyes. I was slipping in people's blood. It was carnage. It was chaos. One of the darkest days in American history, front and center in the first in a series of hearings. The January 6th committee presenting its findings to the American people with emotional testimony from a Capitol Police officer describing the riot as a scene of war. Former President Trump's inner circle, including his daughter, testifying under oath. And now the question of what's next as we await the next hearing coming Monday. News for summer travelers. The United States now lifting travel testing requirements for all international travelers coming into the U.S. How this will impact your upcoming vacation. Talking with a TV legend, the star of Barry discusses the next season of the hit HBO show and shares why it just might be the highlight of his storied acting career. Greatest joy in your career. I would have to say the work I'm doing now this season of Barry, Barry is a gift in the, in the whole thing. The people that I work with, the, the words I get to say. And keeping it in the family, the woman who stepped up to be a surrogate for her own daughter. I was just folding laundry one day and I had this impression to call Caitlin and let her know that I had been thinking about this and that I would like to offer to be the surrogate for these embryos. Good evening, I'm Phil Lipoff, in for Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We are tracking the fallout from that first January 6th hearing, but we do need to begin tonight with your money and the skyrocketing inflation that is showing no signs of letting up. We learned today inflation rose again last month to a 40-year high. The consumer price index is up 8.6% in May compared to a year ago, and a driving factor behind that surge, high food and energy prices. The price of gas up nearly 50% since last year. The average price of a gallon of gas is now basically $5 a gallon. Nearly half of the country is over that mark as well. And the cost of groceries has surged 12% in the last year, the single largest year increase since 1979. President Biden continues to insist inflation is his top priority and acknowledge prices are not coming down as quickly as anticipated. And he once again blamed Vladimir Putin. So when can we expect to see some relief? Chief National Correspondent Matt Gutman leads us off tonight. Tonight, that new report from the government showing inflation is only accelerating. Everything is going up a step out paychecks. Your food bill's up 100 bucks. With prices up 8.6% in May, higher than last month, a new 40-year high. American families spending $346 a month more than they were last year for the same goods. It's getting harder and harder out here. Gas prices up nearly 50% in the last year. Groceries up 12%. It's the largest spike in the cost for staples like eggs, meat, and bread since 1979. If this keeps up, how long does your lifestyle change in any way? I mean, it's already changed in that I don't do as many leisure activities. I'm not driving as much. I'm not spending money maybe on going out to eat. And with polls showing more than 60% of Americans disapprove of his handling of the economy. I understand Americans are anxious, and they're anxious for good reason. President Biden looking for a silver lining in a speech at the Port of Los Angeles today. Inflation outside of energy and food, what the economists call core inflation, moderated the last two months. We needed to come down much more quickly. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, who admitted she was wrong to downplay inflation fears last year, this week asked about the chances of a recession. There's nothing to suggest that inflation and in, that if that a recession's in the works. Matt Gutman joins us now. Matt, we heard what Janet Yellen was saying there at the end of your story. What are economists saying the chances are of a recession? 
pretty high at this point, Phil. Um, we'll know a lot more after the Fed meets next week. They are very likely, given the inflation numbers we just saw, to raise those key interest rates for the third time this year. Higher interest rates typically mean putting the brakes on the economy, which is why analysts like Mark Zandi uh, and others with whom I've been speaking are saying there's at least a 50 50 percent chance of a recession at some point over the next two years. Phil. All right, Matt Gutman, thank you. And that inflation news rattling investors sending stocks into a tailspin. The Dow lost 880 points in its 10th down week in the last 11, fueling those fears of a recession. Now to that first public primetime hearing on the insurrection. The House committee laying out its case that January 6th was, quote, the culmination of an attempted coup and that former President Trump was at the center of it. The American people hearing videotaped testimony from people in the president's inner circle. ABC's chief Washington correspondent, John Carl, has our report. The committee relied on some of those closest to Donald Trump to make its case. His once loyal attorney general, who told investigators Trump's claims of a stolen election were bunk. In that context, I made it clear I did not agree with the idea of saying the election was stolen and putting out this stuff, which I told the president was And the president's own daughter and senior advisor. I respect Attorney General Barr, um, so I accepted what he said was saying. Hours after the hearing, Trump put out a statement saying his daughter, quote, had long since checked out and was only trying to be respectful to Bill Barr. In a dramatic 12-minute video, the committee presented the horror of that day, using previously unseen surveillance video to show every possible angle of the attack. As well as video shot by documentary filmmaker Nick Quested, who was embedded with the Proud Boys in the weeks leading up to January 6th. On that morning, he sensed something was up as he saw a group of some 200 Proud Boys go to the Capitol instead of to the president's rally outside the White House. They were starting to walk down the mall, easterly direction towards the Capitol. There was a large contingent, more than I had expected, and I was a Confused to a certain extent why we were walking away from the president's speech because that's what um, I felt we were there to cover. The committee heard from Caroline Edwards, the first Capitol Police officer injured in the attack. I was slipping in people's blood. You know, I, I was catching people as they fell. I, you know, I was, it was carnage, it was chaos. The top Republican on the committee, Liz Cheney, says they will establish Trump's direct responsibility for that carnage. In one piece of never-before-seen video of the attack, a rioter is shown reading Trump's tweet criticizing his vice president even as the Capitol was breached and how it turned the crowd against Mike Pence. Mike Pence didn't have the courage to do what should have been done to protect our country and our Constitution, giving states a chance to certify a corrected set of Cheney revealing what she said they've learned about what Trump really thought about those hang Mike Pence chants. You will hear testimony that, quote, the president did not really want to put anything out calling off the riot or asking his supporters to leave. You will hear that President Trump was yelling and, quote, really angry at advisors who told him he needed to be doing something more. And aware of the rioters' chance to hang Mike Pence, the president responded with this sentiment, quote, maybe our supporters have the right idea. Mike Pence, quote, deserves it. After the hearing, Trump denied he said that. But listen to what he told me last year in an interview for my book just two months after he left the White House. He Were you worried about him during that, that siege? Were you worried about no, his safety? No, I thought he was well protected, and I, I had heard that he was in good shape. Mm -hmm. No, because uh, I had heard he was in very good shape. But, but no, you I heard those chants. That was terrible. I mean, was, you know, the... He could have... Well, the people were very angry. They're saying, hang my Because it's, it's common sense, John. It's common sense. 
even in that answer to you, John Carl joins us now. John, he he starts by saying, no, he was okay. And at the end of the, uh, the answer, he's talking about how angry people are at him. That hearing last night was really the beginning. How many more of these hearings are scheduled in the coming weeks? The committee plans six more hearings. Each one of them, uh, Phil, will have a specific theme, and the committee says new information, and ultimately information that ties Donald Trump to the events leading up to January 6th and to January 6th itself. Next week, for instance, you will see a, a hearing entirely on the pressure campaign on Mike Pence that will feature testimony uh, from some of his top aides. The big question, of course, is whether or not it will break through, and most importantly, whether it will break through to people who have come to believe Donald Trump's lies about the election, uh, but also his lies about January 6th itself. All right, a lot more to come. John Carl, thank you. Thank you. Joining us now for more context and analysis is constitutional law professor for Cardoza Law School, Deborah Pearlstein. Deborah, thanks so much for being here. Pleasure to be here. First off, anyone who watched last night would have an opinion on, on what happened. What were your thoughts on the hearing last night? Do you feel it was compelling enough to make any kind of of uh, leeway? So I think it depends on which audience uh, you're asking about. Uh, to the extent that the committee is aiming to speak directly to the Attorney General and the Department of Justice, it began to lay out a remarkably clear and specific case that there might be criminal liability for the president here. Uh, a lot of the evidence that they introduced went to the question of what the president knew, what the president's intention was, whether his purpose was corrupt or not. Um, the evidence suggesting that the president knew the election was lost, he knew his claims were false, goes to the question of what his purpose was, and that's an essential element of proving any criminal offense. Um, to the extent the audience here are other members of Congress, I think they've begun to make the case, right? There are important ongoing elements of election subversion efforts that the committee is worried about. There are elements of a trial here. There are witnesses, questions being asked, but it's not a trial. So what happens if Congress does prove any sort of corrupt intent or conspiracy to defraud the United States? Uh, what happens next? They go to the, the Justice Department? What what is their job here? So all Congress has here with respect to criminal charges is the power to persuade. Congress has no power to conduct any trials. It has no power to bring any prosecutions. Um, the only power it has with respect to criminal liability is to try to urge or put pressure on the Department of Justice to the extent it can to pursue criminal prosecution of its own. Ultimately, that decision is up to the Attorney General. Following this, and I'm sure you have as well, you know people have gone to prison. They've been charged. Uh, in a similar way, similar evidence laid out. Um, is there a different bar for evidence here when you're going after the president of the United States, which it seems like from, from the onset uh, of last night's hearing, they did. Um, is there a different bar because he's pre uh, former president? So the requirements for making out a criminal charge are the same, whether the defendant is the former president or whether the defendant is somebody off the street. Uh, the challenge the challenges here are a couple. Um, one is the need to prove intent, the president's, the former president's state of mind. Um, and while you can do that through different kinds of indirect evidence, that's a hard bar to pass in any case, no matter who the defendant is. I know you focus on facts, you focus on the law. From a constitutional perspective, how big a hit do you think it is for our democracy that something like January 6th has become so political? So from my own point of view, right, studying not only U.S. constitutional democracy, but constitutional democracies around the world, what we see in the United States, including most disturbingly on January 6th, 
are the kinds of events we worry about acutely when we look at foreign governments um, and worry about whether the country is sliding away from democracy and into some other form of government. Um, that's when I watched the events of January 6th unfold, when I watched the politicization surrounding those events today. That's what I worry about most, that we no longer have a common perception of how constitutional democracy works, how it's supposed to work, and when we have crossed an indisputably not only illegal, um, but politically unacceptable line. Right, and those who study how democracies end, that's usually one of the ways, one of the, the red flags. So, of course, everybody's going to be paying attention to that. I'm wondering what you're going to be paying attention to as these hearings move forward, particularly the next hearing on Monday. So I think the committee made clear that it is going to address and going to describe a multi-pronged conspiracy. There were efforts to interfere with the outcome of the election at the federal level, at the state level, through state legislatures and election administrators, and through a public disinformation campaign that the committee suggested last night is itself responsible for the violence. My expectation is that they'll start with the federal level. The efforts uh, to get the Department of Justice, the efforts by the president to get the Department of Justice um, to interfere with its uh, its own investigation into uh, election fraud, the efforts to uh, get Mike Pence, the vice president, to take action on January 6th uh, that the former president knew to be unlawful. Uh, and I expect we'll hear from former Department of Justice officials, uh, members of the former vice president's staff, uh, who can help shed direct light on what the former president's role was in those efforts. Constitutional Law Professor Deborah Perlstein, thank you so much for taking the time and your insight tonight. Thank you. And a quick note for you, ABC News will carry the committee's second public hearing live attack on the Capitol. The investigation will air on Monday, 10 a.m. Eastern. Now to the investigation in Uvalde. In a newspaper interview, the school district police chief defending himself, saying that during the response to the mass shooting, he didn't see himself as an on-scene commander. But as the massacre unfolded, he did call for tactical gear and acknowledges that he was standing by in the hallways for more than an hour. So how does this account line up with what we've already heard? Here's ABC's Maria Villarreal in Texas. Tonight, embattled school district police chief Pete Arredondo defending his actions during the massacre at Robb Elementary that left 21 people dead. Guy with a rifle. The chief telling the Texas Tribune, despite what state officials say, he did not see himself as the incident commander on site and assumed another official had taken control, claiming, I didn't issue any orders. But he does acknowledge using his cell phone to call for tactical gear, a sniper and keys to get inside the locked classroom, saying he told officers to break windows to evacuate oh, students. The oh, not the kids, the kid. they're getting the kids out. After officers were grazed with bullets, Chief Arredondo and others retreated into the hallway for more than an hour, while officials say gunfire could be heard four more times. Teacher Arnolfo Reyes, who was laying on the floor, shot multiple times, telling ABC News the gunman started shooting again right after a child called out for help. One of the students from the next door classroom um, was saying, officer, we're in here, we're in here. And then, uh, but they had already left. And then um, he got up from, from my, behind my desk and he walked over there and he shot over there again. As for those 911 calls from the classroom. Arredondo telling the Tribune he was not aware of them because he left his radio behind, believing it would slow him down. But students like Mia Cedillo were still alive and begging for help. What did you tell 911? I told her that we need help. And she said the police in, the, in our classroom. And Arredondo seemed aware that police needed to move faster. An official telling ABC News he was overheard that day saying, people are going to ask why we're taking so long. There is no excuse for their actions, and I will never forgive them. 
The New York Times also reported teacher Eva Mireles called her husband a police officer who was outside the school, telling him she was dying. That information reaching other officers 15 minutes into the rampage. Eva died on the way to the hospital and today was laid to rest. Absolutely heartbreaking. Maria Villarreal joins us now. Maria, you're hearing some new information about a preliminary assessment by state investigators. You know, Phil, uh, ABC's investigative team has been all over this. They've been able to confirm right now that preliminary assessments do show that the decision to delay police officers from going inside that classroom was so they could wait for tactical gear to show up on scene. And that's a decision that contradicts most active shooter protocols that have been in place for at least 20 years. Phil? All right, Maria Villarreal, thank you. Next here, major news for international travel. Sources telling ABC News the White House will lift the requirement that travelers test negative for COVID before boarding a plane to the U.S. The airline's welcoming the move just as the summer travel season kicks into high gear. Here's ABC's transportation correspondent, Gio Benitez. Just as the nation prepares for record-breaking summer travel, tonight, a major change for those flying into the country. Sources telling ABC News the Biden administration will end the requirement for a negative COVID test before entering the United States. Starting Sunday morning, just after midnight, anyone would be able to fly into the U.S. without that negative test. The decision comes as the U.S. is averaging nearly 110,000 new cases a day, back up to one of its highest points since February. More than 4,100 are hospitalized with COVID each day. But with higher vaccination rates and less severe cases, the airline industry has lobbied to lift the requirement that has been in place for the last 17 months. Tonight, the major U.S. airlines applauding the decision. United saying in a statement, this is another important step, not just for air travel, but also for all the tourism jobs that international travel supports. JetBlue's president telling us this will almost certainly boost summer travel. A lot of people didn't want to travel internationally because of the testing requirement. This provides them with peace of mind so that they know when they're traveling they can make it home. And Gio Benitez joins us now. Gio, I'm curious, does the CDC plan on reassessing this decision as COVID infections and variants continue to come up? Well, Phil, that is what we're told, that the CDC would reassess its decision in some 90 days. And we're also told, by the way, that non-U.S. citizens, they're still going to need to provide proof of vaccination before flying into the United States. Phil. Mm. Gio Benitez, thank you. Now to the severe storms slamming the Gulf Coast. Heavy rain, flash flooding, sweeping through Greenwood, Arkansas. You can see the water rushing right past City Hall there. Uh, and in the West, dangerous and record-setting heat for millions of people from California to Texas. ABC's senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is tracking it all for us. Hey, Rob. Hi, Phil. Boy, we had some rough storms move, move through uh, Florida. Brevard County had some lightning strikes that unfortunately injured two small kids. They were taken to the, to the hospital. Probably the same cell produce a wind gust of 62 miles an hour in Port Canaveral just on the coast. Here's the radar. It shows you the heavy rain. Most of it has shifted down into South Florida, and we still have leftovers of a severe thunderstorm watch for parts of Louisiana and the Florida Panhandle, and these storms have produced winds uh, gusting up close to 60 miles an hour. They'll wind down tonight after sunset, but the heat will be come up during the day tomorrow. We broke a record today in Phoenix, Palm Springs, Sacramento 101 tomorrow. Heat, excessive heat warnings for those spots and the heat advisories you see for much of Texas and Oklahoma as the heat continues to build there. The next three days are not going to be cool. Dangerous heat with temperatures that are not going to cool down overnight uh, very much. Kansas City will get to close to 100 on Monday at an over 100 the next three days plus in Dallas and this heat dome then shifts a little bit farther to the east into the nation's heartland. Philip. All right, here comes summer. Rob, thanks. Now to the war in Ukraine. Russia may be closing in on control of those contested regions in the east. Ukraine's military says Russia could keep up this pace for another year, making a desperate plea now for more military aid to keep up its fight. James Longman reports from Ukraine. With the battle raging for control of the Donbass region, a top advisor to President Zelensky tonight saying up to 200 Ukrainian soldiers are being killed every day. And officials now warn Russia could continue this brutal level of fighting for another year. President Zelensky today meeting with the UK's defense minister in Kyiv, pleading for more funding and high-powered weapons. Ukraine's success in pushing Putin's forces out of the north around Kyiv, now a distant memory. 
I met Mikola in Bucha back in April when the world discovered the horrors the Russians had left behind. Mikola shook with trauma as he told us about the three friends he'd had to bury in his frozen backyard. How are you? A reunion today full of joy. You look well, you look... But the painful memories remain, a reminder of what's at stake now in the East. When this went on television, afterwards I got many, many messages. Many people in America care about you. They want to know how you are. Stan. I don't feel great, he says, crying. I start remembering, and it's hard. I try to calm myself down. I see my friends, my family, but I just feel bad. I do need to continue living, though, and all I want is for us to have a good life. U.S. Defense Secretary Austin will travel to Brussels next week to discuss this crisis. No doubt Ukraine will ask for yet more weapons to get here faster. Phil. All right, James, thank you. When we come back, the first responders desperately searching for two teens missing at sea and the grim discovery. Our Lindsay Davis sits down with legendary actor Henry Winkler about season finale of his latest hit, Barry, just days away. But up next, the cutting edge method one couple is deploying to help with the trauma and mental health challenges so many are facing now, particularly after these relentless mass shootings. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. The hottest views in daytime are happening right here. We talk about things on this show that people don't talk about. That I can't wait to see. Honest takes from strong women. We need all hands on deck and we need it right now. This is the time to speak out. Unafraid to get real. We stick by our points of view. We're all seeing it differently and that's the beauty of The View. And that's why the most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again, then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, the darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money. That's all we do. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Welcome back. We have an update to a story we've been covering here on Prime for you. A Texas judge has temporarily blocked the state from investigating families of trans children who have received gender-confirming medical care. Texas had been attempting to label such treatments as child abuse. The temporary restraining order was issued after three families sued. 
From the recent mass shootings to this national conversation about mental illness, we are suffering as a country right now while desperately seeking solutions to everything from gun violence to suicide. And that's why we're taking you on a journey now to Logan, Utah, to meet a couple with a cause that's doing just that, where a cup of coffee, a conversation, and a cutting edge concept is saving lives. Kira Phillips with more. Too many. Words we hear far too often when talking to families and friends of veterans who've died by suicide. It's not just a veteran problem, it's a whole community problem. A problem Jamie Butters and his wife Mindy take personally. I know if this, if this would have been available at that point, he would be here today. Yeah, for sure. Jamie and Mindy's friend, veteran Herb Haller, was struggling with post-traumatic stress. You would have never thought anything was wrong with him. He seemed like the happiest person on earth. And his girlfriend actually tried to hide his guns from him, but he ended up finding them. And on June 6, 2021, Herb died by suicide, and the Butters realized they had to do more. Welcome to my coffee shop. That's why they turned their coffee shop, Cash Coffee Cafe, in Logan, Utah, into a safe place. I came up with the idea because we had a, another veteran bring in his guns and say, here, can you hold these for me? Anyone, specifically vets, struggling with suicidal thoughts. Safe is about two weeks old. Can now store their guns here while getting the counseling they need. A waiting period, firearm free, that the Butters hope will help save lives, lives like Lee's. Jamie and Mindy actually talked me down. And it was the first time that I ever actually got real help. Lee, who has asked us to protect his identity, was injured by six IEDs while serving in Iraq. He says his life was shattered. My life pretty much fell apart. And that was the first time I started getting suicidal tendencies. He had already attempted suicide three times until the Butters' mission moved him. They were genuinely concerned about what was going on, how I was feeling, what I needed. Help, this Navy vet said he needed too. Struggling with mental illness and alcohol, William also wanted to take his own life. Some things had happened at home. I didn't see no way out of it. So I grabbed my gun, threw it in my backpack, and went to leave. And as soon as I did that, my wife was on the phone. And on the other end of that phone call, Jamie Butters. I pretty much physically had to take his gun out of his hands, and it was a pretty scary moment. Wrestling that gun out of William's hands, convincing him to store it here in Cash Coffee Cafe. Right now, the gun I was gonna use for myself is in the safe behind me. I truly believe if, if my wife wouldn't have gotten a hold of Jamie, I wouldn't be here. Today, the Butters say that safe holds three pistols, two rifles, and a knife securing those weapons and assuring these veterans their life is worth living. They're bringing their gun in, they're, we're putting their gun in the safe, and we're helping them find somebody to help them. And it's not like we just drop them off and call it a day. We actually point them in a direction to a counselor, somebody who can get them some help, somebody they can talk to. Silver Stars, Bronze Star. So far, that's like Williams say, it's working. Jamie and Mindy, have been so kind to my family and helping me out. These are true, two truly, truly amazing people. A thanks to Kira Phillips, and what a beautiful thing the Butters are doing. They just launched a nonprofit there in Logan, Utah, the Community Family Coalition, connecting individuals in their community who are struggling to mental health professionals. And if you are struggling with thoughts of suicide or worried about a friend or a loved one, help is available. You can call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255 for free, confidential, emotional support, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Still ahead here on Prime, the Pope canceling a high-profile trip, we'll explain. And have you seen Britney Spears' wedding photos yet? We've got them for you. And the newly expanded law in California aimed at helping save the bees. We take a look by the numbers. But first, our post of the day is from Justin Bieber, revealing to the world that he will be briefly sidelined due to partial facial paralysis. We're sending good thoughts his way. 
those who are frustrated by my cancellations of the next shows, um, I'm just physically obviously not <laughs> capable of doing them. The deeper you go into the black market, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. This is ABC News Live. The crushing the families trunk. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. We made it. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again, then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, the darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money. That's why we do it. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. These days, with so much going on, it's hard to keep up. While others are recapping yesterday's headlines, we're bringing you the right now. This is the busy border crossing. Steel barricades, another strike. The right now look at the day ahead, how it affects you and your family. Record high gas prices. The threat of cyber warfare. Is peace possible? World News Now beginning at 2 a.m. Eastern, followed by America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Streaming here on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated abcnews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at abcnews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Welcome back. A newly expanded law in America's biggest state could actually help save the bees and in turn preserve our planet. Bees have been declared fish in California. You heard that correctly. Let's explain by the numbers. Four species of bumblebees are now protected under the Golden State's Endangered Species Law. An appeals court ruled this week under the 1970 California Endangered Species Law that bees are now legally considered fish in the state. Section 45 of California's Fish and Game Code defines fish as wild fish, mollusks, crustacean, amphibians, or invertebrates. So a judge has ruled since insects are invertebrates, bees can be protected. So what does this all mean? Bees pollinate three out of four crops that produce fruits and seeds for human consumption. Three out of four. Simply put, no bees would decimate the global economy. The UN estimates bees contribute $217 billion to the global economy. California accounts for 20% of all pesticides used in the U.S. Overuse kills bees. So the new protection since California means farmers will need to watch their pesticide use, at least around the areas where bees pollinate. The Department of Agriculture estimates the bee population has declined from 6 million in the 40s to 2.5 million in 2021. We still have a lot more to get to here on Prime. The desperate search for the missing journalist in the Amazon and meet the grandma surrogate. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. at stake in our world right now we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making abc news america's number one news and thank you for making abc news live america's number one streaming news now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. 
National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. To a primetime television audience, the House Select Committee investigating the January 6th attack on the Capitol, methodically laying out the results of its 11-month-long investigation. The committee arguing the deadly Capitol riot was an attempted coup and arguing former President Donald Trump was at the center of a conspiracy to overturn the 2020 election. During the hearing, playing taped testimony from those in Trump's inner circle, like former Attorney General Bill Barr and his daughter Ivanka, to make the case Trump knew he'd lost the election. Republican Congresswoman Liz Cheney, the committee's vice chair, not mincing words about Trump's alleged culpability in the riot or that of her Republican colleagues who continue to support him. There will come a day when Donald Trump is gone, but your dishonor will remain. Inflation up 8.6% compared to a year ago, the largest yearly increase since 1981, a new four-decade high. Americans digging deeper into their pockets, gas just two cents shy of an average of $5 a gallon across the country. Experts are saying demand for fuel will only rise over the summer, which means prices will just keep going up. Overall, families spending on average $346 more each month to to buy the same things they did a year ago, according to Moody's Analytics. President Biden says the government is taking steps to slow this growing crisis, vowing to address supply chain issues. Two 13-year-olds have sadly died after being pulled out of rough waters in Spring Creek Park in Queens, New York. Witnesses say the teens were playing on a surfboard. People on the shore called 911, and firefighters helped most of the kids back to shore but two got caught in the currents. It took nearly an hour to get the children from the water. The names of the two swimmers have not yet been released. The search for a British journalist and an indigenous official continues in the Amazon rainforest in Brazil. Journalist Dom Phillips, a regular contributor to the newspaper The Guardian, and Bruno Arojo Pereira, an employee of the Brazilian Indigenous Affairs Agency, were last seen on Sunday in the remote area of Javari Valley, an indigenous territory. They were returning by boat to a nearby city, but never arrived at their destination. According to the Associated Press, three fishermen had threatened the pair with guns the day before they went missing. One of the fishermen has been arrested and is being considered the main suspect in the disappearance. The Vatican announced Pope Francis is postponing his July trip to Africa. The decision followed a request by doctors so the Pope doesn't jeopardize therapy for his knee. The Vatican says it will reschedule the Congo and South Sudan visits. Pope Francis has been using a wheelchair for about a month. 
New photos show Britney Spears with her now husband Sam Asghari at their wedding yesterday. The couple tied the knot after a five-year-long relationship and less than a year after Spears won the fight to end her conservatorship. But just hours before the ceremony, the pop star's first husband, Jason Alexander, tried to crash the party. TMZ reports that Alexander live-streamed as he approached event security and claimed his ex-wife invited him. He even went into Spears' house before he was eventually detained outside. The Ventura County Sheriff's Office confirmed to ABC News they responded to a trespassing call and arrested Alexander on an outstanding warrant for embezzlement and receiving stolen property. Spears' attorney, Matthew Rosengart, confirming in a statement to ABC News that Alexander is under an emergency protective order to stay away from her. Rosengart calling the incident an outrageous security breach, but saying that fortunately, Brittany is safe and was, quote, a stunning and happy bride. We're tracking several headlines also around the world at this hour. Flanked by the leaders of 19 countries, President Biden announced the Los Angeles Declaration of Migration and Protection on the final day of the Summit of the Americas. According to the president, 20 different countries signed on to the agreement, which includes commitments to increase refugee resettlement and expand migrant labor programs throughout the region. The president also assured that the declaration includes a commitment to strengthen border security, as well as the administration's intention to expand a multilateral sting operation that aims to disrupt human trafficking in Latin America. Ecuador will play at the 2022 World Cup after FIFA dismissed Chile's claims that they had fielded an ineligible player in the qualifiers. The Chilean Football Federation last month said it had proof that a player for Ecuador was actually Colombian and used a false passport and birth certificate. FIFA said in part, quote, after analyzing the submissions of all parties concerned and considering all elements brought before it, the FIFA Disciplinary Committee has decided to close the proceedings. According to international reports, Jamaica will have ditched Queen Elizabeth as its head of state by 2025, says a senior minister in the Caribbean nation. The nation's newly created Ministry of Legal and Constitutional Affairs told Parliament that the process to transition to a republic had formally commenced. However, removing the British monarchy will be done in stages and is expected to involve a majority vote in both the House and the Senate. The people of Jamaica are also expected to be given a choice in a referendum. Now to a TV legend who continues captivating audiences. Henry Winkler says he is in his prime, starring in the hit HBO series Barry, which is about to embark on season three. Our Lindsay Davis sat down with the former Happy Days star who calls Barry the highlight of his storied career. I want to start with the Fonz. Yes. You have talked about how you put the character on and you sewed it to your being. Yes. How did you ultimately extricate yourself? At 11 o'clock at night or 12 o'clock at night when the filming was done, I took the jacket off, uh, I put on my button-down shirt, and then he was in the closet in my dressing room and I was in the car going home. It, it was never a process. But after years of doing the Fonz, it seems like you became so typecast. Yes, that is true. How did you ultimately move beyond that? There was a, a concern from the beginning of my training that I did not want to be a flash in the pan, that I did not want to be known and then disappear. So that was a fear, which is a great motivator, by the way. Fear works miracles. I thought, because the Fonz was so popular, I was going to beat the system. There is no beating the system. Well, ultimately you did. Will. I just kept getting up and moving forward. Knocked over, got up, kept moving forward because I knew what I wanted. Favorite character you've ever played? Don't have one. Love them all. That I'm living my dream is, uh, I, I'm a very verbal fellow. I don't have the words to tell you how um, happy I am. Let's talk about how happy you were getting the Emmy. <gasps> I wrote this 43 years ago. It's true. What did that moment mean to you? Well, and you really had written it 43 years ago. The part that I wrote was, you can go to sleep now, kids. They were now 37, 40, and 49. But I did write, you can go to sleep now, kids. Daddy won. 
So let's talk about Barry and the idea of playing an acting coach, right? And you've said before that you've had maybe 14 or so acting teachers in your life That's right. up through your time at, at Yale. Right. The character you play now, is it a combination? He is. Okay. He's a combination of what is written, of my imagination, and bits and pieces of my teachers. So we've recently learned that Barry... Right killed yes. Jean's lifelong love. Yes. How did that change the dynamic in those two characters' so, relationship? So, at the end of, uh, of season two, I find out that it's Barry who has ripped my heart apart. So, what do I do? The umbrella of this third season is can people change? And I think that there is an undertow of revenge. I'm trying desperately to be a better person. But it gnaws at me that Barry has done this. And now, when you're playing the character, do you come in and you really bring yourself into it? Do you define? Every character is already in you. And then it is your imagination the to take what the author says, what people say office. about oh, you so in the script, what the director oh, says, like a doe, you know? And then you all of a sudden have a pizza of a character. How did your son, Max, who's now a director, help you land this current role in Barry? because he literally directed my audition. I brought home the script. I said, would you look at it? I sat at my desk. He looked, he stood over my shoulder and literally yelled at me. I improvised. He said, respect the writer. I, he said, you know, there's an exclamation point. You can get a little more angry. So when I went in, I had a handle on the material. You've had these really seminal moments, right? Landing the role of the Fonz when you were 27. Yes. Then landing Barry at 72. Yes. Now 76. Do you feel like you're really kind of reinventing yourself? I have reinvented myself many times uh, writing children's books. Uh, that was a time filler. I didn't know what to do, and nor was I being hired around 2001 after I did a Broadway play with Rest His Soul, John Ritter. So somebody said, write books about your dyslexia for children. I said, I'm dyslexic, I can't do that. They said, I'll introduce you to Lynn Oliver. I said, okay. And we hatched Hank Zipser. We've written 30 nine novels together. And how does that work? You know, you didn't even realize until you were 31 you no, were dyslexic. that I was yeah. dyslexic. How do you do it? You do it because you want it, because there is a way to, f to figure it out. I met a little girl, 12 years old, Olivia. Olivia is dyslexic. And I said to her, how you learn has nothing to do with how brilliant you are. I know I asked you about character, but I'm gonna ask it this way. Greatest joy in your career? I would have to say the work I'm doing now. We are this season of Barry, Barry is a gift in the, in the whole line. thing. Line. The people that I work words. with, the, the words I get to say. Can you give us any kind of spoiler for the season finale? Intense. I asked Bill, a uh, hater, I said, uh, what can I say? I'm going to New York, I'm doing press for our, um, for our finale. What can I say? And he looked at me and he said, Nothing. He's very strict. <laughs> there is a list of national treasures. You're on that list. No. Excuse me. I'm just going to bask for a minute. <laughs> no, there's a list? Yeah, there's a list. Hey, can, can I just call my wife? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. What do you want your legacy to be? Oh. That I have grown into a person who has left whatever the gift is behind. There was a time when I was okay at being a professional and maybe like uh, a muffin and you put a toothpick in it mm -hmm. and it's still mushy in the center. I was mushy for a long time. 
How'd you finally get fully baked? I wanted to, mm. and I just kept working at it. <sighs> I'm just living a most wonderful life, and I am grateful. Great sentiment. Who knew the Fonz was mushy in the center? The season finale of Barry airs Sunday, 10 p.m. Eastern uh, on HBO. And our thanks to Lindsay Davis for that. Now we turn to Jennifer Lopez calling out the NFL in a new Netflix documentary. The film shines a light on how Lopez fought to make her performance political and bring awareness to the U.S. controversy over immigration. ABC's Kaylee Hartung has more on what the superstar had to say. Jennifer Lopez pulling back the curtain on the halftime show that made history. JLo taking viewers behind the scenes of the 2020 Super Bowl show. One, two, three, Super Bowl! Which marked the first time two Latina artists headlined the world's biggest stage. But with the NFL's decision to have JLo and Shakira share top billing, came frustration because it meant the hitmakers would need to split their time. JLo saying in the documentary, this was the worst idea in the world. I'm trying to give you something with substance. I want something real. The doc revealing JLo fought to make her show pointed and political. Putting children, including her own daughter, in cages on stage and draping herself in a Puerto Rican flag making a statement just as the U.S. was embroiled in controversy over immigration. The NFL said that they wanted her to take that out of her performance pretty much immediately, just 24 hours before the show, but she stood her ground. In this exclusive clip from halftime, Jayla revealing what she told her daughter. I said, you look right down that camera and you tell every little girl in the world to get loud and to never, ever back down from bringing light to injustice. The performance, one for the history books. That year was a, just turned out to be an incredible year for me where everything I had worked for my whole life just kind of exploded <laughs> in one year. And thanks for Kaylee for that. Uh, putting to the test the lengths a mother would go for her child, and they are great. This Utah mother and grandmother became a surrogate for her daughter after she struggled with infertility. ABC News' Will Gans with the story. At 49 years old, having raised eight kids of her own, you might think Shalise Smith would be done carrying any pregnancies. And yet on May 17th... She was 7 pounds, 13 ounces, 21 inches long, so nice and healthy baby. The Utah mother and grandmother welcoming a little girl into the world because Shalise was a surrogate for her 25-year-old daughter, Caitlin, who had been struggling with infertility. Becoming a surrogate was a decision Shalise didn't take lightly. It was on my mind daily. I thought about it. I prayed about it. Just wondering and asking if this was a direction or a path for me. Until finally, one day, a moment of clarity. I was just folding laundry one day and I had this impression to call Caitlin and let her know that I had been thinking about this and that I would like to offer to be the surrogate for these embryos. Caitlin and her husband Miguel accepted Shalise's offer and after getting medical clearance from her doctors, Shalise began the IVF process for her daughter. We FaceTimed every day. She would always check in on me to make sure I was okay and I'd, and I'd always respond to her, I'm good, things are going well and... She'd have to call my husband. Is mom really telling me the truth? <laughs> Thankfully, mom was telling the truth. The pregnancy was an easy one. Shalise turning 50 while six months pregnant and even celebrated that birthday at Disneyland with her family. And then finally, baby Elena was born on May 17th. The little girl's middle name, Kate Shalise, a nod to her grandmother who carried her and her mom who will raise her. And this little baby girl was placed on her mom's chest. My heart was just overflowing, and there was so much peace and love. And I just knew that this little baby was supposed to be with these parents. And it just has given me so much joy that I don't look back and have any regrets. Amazing, Will Gans. Thank you for that. Before we go tonight, the image of the day. Take a look. Love is love behind a sign depicting a rainbow and a pink-colored hand at Tel Aviv's annual Pride Parade. That's our show for now. I'm Phil Lipoff. Stay with ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks for streaming with us.
America's number one news.